This week on Young Rock, Leah Maivia is on a warpath for Greg Yao, Ada has the opportunity to chase her dreams on Star Search, and Little Dewey really just wants a boogie board. We're talking Young Rock Season 1, Episode 9 on Pro Wrestling Repackaged. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Chris. And my name is Tessa. And this is Pro Wrestling Repackaged, where the squared circle meets the small screen. This week, we're discussing Season 1, Episode 9 of Young Rock, A Lady Named Star Search. But before we dive in, we neglected to mention the fact that there was a special appearance in the last episode by none other than Bruno Lauer, a.k.a. Harvey Whippleman. He appears at the end of the episode when The Rock eats a cheesesteak and he says, Go Eagles! And there was so much that we were discussing last week that we forgot to mention it. But I did want to make mention of that because Bruno Lauer is, of course, a very important person in The Rock's life. He helped him out when The Rock was just starting his career, very early on in his career. And The Rock even gave him a new truck, I believe, over Christmas last year. I think we talked about this in a, another episode. We did, yes. It sounds very familiar, and there was a whole Instagram post about it. So, yes, Bruno Lauer, a.k.a. Harvey Whippleman, a.k.a. Downtown Bruno. The guy has a million different nicknames, but if you're a longtime wrestling fan, you probably know the name, but you might not have recognized him because he looks a little bit different these days, but we did catch that, and I wanted to mention that, make mention off the top real quick, because we did neglect to mention that last episode. And with that, let's jump right into this week's edition of The Rock Says. The Rock Says, The Rock Says. What's The Rock Say? Tessa, what was your favorite quote from this episode? So last week I chose a quote from 2032, Dwayne, and I'm doing it again this week. This is when he's preparing to have his first presidential debate. And he asks his campaign manager, is it cool if I refer to my opponent as a little candy ass? I could say, I'm going to check your little candy ass into the SmackDown hotel. Campaign manager is not having that. (laughs) He's still just living off of his 1998 material, even in 2032. (laughs) He's in the political arena. He is still... (laughs) Going back to the old reliable catchphrases. He's staying real classy out there. Yeah. (laughs) Presidential material. Interesting, though. The past two weeks, you've had a 2032 quote, and we both (laughs) discussed how we aren't really the biggest fan of the 2032 segments, but it seems like, I don't know, the past few weeks, maybe they've been doing a little bit more, at least for you. I think I don't like the concept of the 2032 stuff, but he still has some good lines. He does. He does. Usually with... Randall. Yes. Which, again, there was no Randall this week. So we're just coming into this with our arms crossed, very, (laughs) very stern. And just we're we just we've just had enough. There's there are two more episodes, so we better get two episodes just chock full of Randall, whatever. He better be in all three time periods in in the final episode. You got to come full circle. Yes, we, we need Randall to have met The Rock at some point earlier in his life. And that's why he's doing the sit down interview. I'll make mention off the top since I, I just mentioned it there that we did find out that there will be an 11th episode. We had some discussion last week about whether there will just be 10 or 11, and we do now conclusively know that there will be 11, and the 11th episode will be the season finale, and it is entitled Election Day, so take with that what you will. Oh, boy. (laughs) My quote for this week is from Rocky Johnson, because Rocky Johnson gets a lot of the best material in this show, and that's just the standard for his character. (laughs) He always has some of the best quotes. And he, I think he had one of the best quotes of this episode, which was, we believe in standing up for ourselves in this family, but sometimes the fight isn't always fair. When that happens, no, I always got your back. I really just like that. I like the moment between the father and son. I loved supportive father, Rocky Johnson. Always. And a supportive everything in this episode, Rocky Johnson, supportive father slash husband slash son-in-law. He's everyone. He's supporting their endeavors and he's he's doing a great job. We'd love to see it. We do. But let us dive right into the discussion of this episode. Season one, episode nine, A Lady Named Star Search, directed by Jeffrey Walker, written by Cindy Fang. Tessa, what the hell happened this episode? (laughs) So in this episode, Atta finally hears back from Star Search about an in-person audition in Los Angeles. 
and Rocky has been talking with Vince McMahon about his future in the WWF. Meanwhile, Leah decides it is time to rule with an iron fist and seeks out revenge on Greg Yao, which will only lead to more trouble, and it looks like some legal problems. Dewey, on the other hand, has some trouble of his own, a bully who steals his boogie board. (laughs) It felt like a rocket power (laughs) storyline. Young rocket power. (laughs) Imagine the rock in that universe now. Oh, I would love it. (laughs) Overall, I thought that this was a very strong family-oriented episode, which is when I think this show is at its best in a lot of ways. It wasn't very wrestling-heavy, aside from some references to real-life events that we did get, and we will mention all of those, of course. And it wasn't necessarily the funniest episode, although I thought that Rocky in particular, his, he's hysterical. He always is. But I think it's really just the heart of this episode that really makes this show what it is when you zoom out and look at it as a whole. And this episode definitely did have a lot of heart, in my opinion. Yeah, I think any episode that's surrounded by everything that's going on with each member of the family is always going to be a pretty strong one. Dewey doesn't get a whole lot to do. (laughs) He just kind of gets beat up. (laughs) Yeah, he gets the most conflict that he's ever had in this show, (laughs) uh, which is to say that it's it's a very easily (laughs) resolved one and albeit a little bit dangerous. Kids with knives, not a great scenario. No. (laughs) But yeah, not the highest stakes, but He's what? He's 10. 10 years old. He's 10. So. He's getting a lot more than what he did that first 1982 episode, though. So good for him. <laughs> yeah, I feel like he gets a little bit more with each outing. So if this does get renewed for season two, I'd be really interested to see how much material they can really give Adrian Gru in a further season if he's able to maybe have a little bit of an expanded role because he does seem a bit like a side character mm-hmm. in a show called Young Rock. It seems like at least in this time period, The Rock is the side character, which is not a problem because I think it gives us a lot of great time with Leah and, of course, his parents, which is, again, part of what makes this show so strong is that sometimes we can really focus on the family, which it's a family show. And that's really at the heart of it what it is. Yeah, I did miss the wrestlers, though. I think they make 1982 more colorful and entertaining. And I think I consider them to be part of the family. So... When they're not there, I get a little sad. But hopefully we will see. We have two more episodes left. Hopefully, at least in the finale, hopefully we will get some more and get to say goodbye to the wrestlers for season one. And then from there, who knows at this point? (laughs) (laughs) But we kick things off in 2032 with The Rock on the debate stage with Senator Braden Taft. So The Rock is having his very first presidential debate. And here we finally have someone calling The Rock out. Taft criticizes him for being a movie star, to which Dwayne responds by low-key fat-shaming former President Taft, and then taking a quick moment to tell a little story about his family. But we all know where this is going, and The Rock launches into storytelling mode. Of course he does. <laughs> I mean, and really, with this guy, old habits die hard. Of course he takes that opportunity to do some fat shaming of the relative of his opponent in the middle of a presidential debate. Again, very classy. Yeah. Old habits die hard for this guy, and he's still going to that well of being the rock. And it works. It totally works. By the end of this episode, he's got everyone in the palm of his hand, at least at that debate. Senator Taft is is ruffled. He, but he's, this is finally when we have someone who isn't just pandering to him. Yeah. Which I think is really good. Like, yes. How is this a little story? Why hasn't anyone been asking this the entire time? (laughs) The exact quote there was, that was your quick story? You've exceeded your allotted time by what, 20 minutes? And The Rock just goes, yes. Thank you very much. This man doesn't care. (laughs) Smiles and everyone's, everyone's happy except for Taft. And he's also a liar. He says, no one has had to fight harder than I have. There is no way that's true. I mean, sure, The Rock has gone through plenty of hardships. But that time is well over, and there are plenty of people who have faced way more struggles than him. But I think the idea is that that's part of what made him and shaped him. So he carries that around still, even though, you know, he lives in the lap of luxury. He also really does, he is one of the hardest working people in entertainment right now. There is is very little that he is not doing on any given day. 
but, but no he one's does. Ma- he he worked really hard to get there, and he works really hard to stay there. I think is the idea. I mean, no one's forcing The Rock to like come out with a new product or business every week. <laughs> no, but I think that he, having been at the bottom and having to fight and scratch and claw to get to the top, and you know all the cliches. I think that he appreciates it maybe a little bit more than the average person who didn't have the kind of upbringing that he had, where his dad was this big wrestling star and then suddenly they were at the bottom and they found themselves in a tough situation. So I think that he does appreciate the peak because he was in the valley. And I think that that makes it more, I guess, it still resonates with him even in 2032, even in a fictional 2032 when he is still one of the most recognizable people on the planet and has enough <laughs> power and support to run for president and <laughs> be at this stage of the game. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> one thing I wanted to mention is that it is almost the end of the season. It is definitely the last 82 episode, and I still barely feel like I know some of these people in the 2032 segments, like... Casey and even Sandy. It's like we're just suddenly introduced to Casey one episode and then all of a sudden she's just she's there sometimes. She's not there a lot of the times. And I think it's the problem of we don't consistently get these characters in each 2032 scene. They are just kind of spread out. And if you do that over the course of a 10 episode season, it's hard enough to remember what happened the last time we were in 82 or 90 or 87. You know, it's hard when you have a few weeks in between each time period. So that could be avoided in 2032 if you had the characters be consistent. But they're not. And I still barely feel like Casey came on the screen. And if he didn't say her name, I wouldn't have remembered it. And we cover this show. We take notes on this show. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we we know Randall more than we know any of these people. And even his VP pick. We've seen Monica Jackson twice. I feel like we should get to know her a little more. She should be more of a mainstay in the 2032 stuff than just like a campaign manager. Alas, there is only so much they can do with the few minutes in each episode over the course of 10 episodes. That's just, which is kind of why I feel like, well, maybe do something different then. I don't know. <laughs> 2032 still not lighting my world on fire, but I guess we'll see what happens come election day oh, because uh, we have that to look forward to. He's going to win, too. Oh, I mean, I don't see any <laughs> any way in which I don't see Taft winning. Certainly don't see that. Unless he after, gets crushed. Ap- after that joke about his uh, great, what is it, great, great, great grandfather. Yeah. Let's move on now to the 1982 portion of the episode in Hawaii. And let's talk about Ata and Star Search. So after sending in her audition tape in the last 1982 episode, Ata waits for Star Search to contact her. But when she doesn't hear anything, she just assumes they threw her tape in the trash. But it turns out this whole time, They had left a message on her phone inviting her to come to L.A. for an audition, but she doesn't realize how phones work, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, she thought the button with the envelope on it summoned a mailman (laughs) from a hotel room phone. But so she's all ready to go to L.A. She's at the airport, but then the thought of being away from Dewey for any extended period of time, if she wins, is just too much for her. So she leaves and returns to her son. Which is the classic mother separation anxiety type of storyline. And I feel like I've seen that a lot. But it makes sense with this particular family and these particular characters. I think it makes sense. And it really just speaks to Ata's dedication to her family and the importance of family, which is kind of been drilled into us at this point by the end of the season. We we know that very strong family bond, which is why it's... It, I guess is why it's so easy for, for example, Rocky to forgive Leah for the screw job, which we will definitely get into. But, uh, I, you know, I I really wish we could have at least seen an audition scene. I It just it harkens me back to the Full House episode where Joey goes on star search. So that <laughs> that's just immediately what my mind goes back to. But uh, I wish we could have seen something, but she doesn't even make it out of the airport in Hawaii. <laughs> I love that Ada cares so much about her son and her family and about just being a mom in general that she chose to give up this amazing opportunity for them. But at the same time, I would love to see her just become a star. Like, obviously, we know that doesn't happen 
in real life. But I would have loved to just see her get more of an opportunity. I guess there are only so many liberties they can take Mm -hmm. when you're doing historical fiction, I guess. Or biography fiction? I don't know. A biofic? I don't know. I don't know what what to really call call it. But I think that moment where she asked Rocky, so if we're on tour, what about Dewey? Because as things are kind of, you know, taking shape for Atta with her Star Search audition, things are really starting to pop off for Rocky, too, because Mm -hmm. he had this great conversation with Vince McMahon. And Vince is talking about bringing him and Tony Atlas in as a tag team and giving them a run for the tag team titles. So these are happening in parallel. And Atta immediately goes to, what about our son? We cannot have our son's life be completely upended by the fact that we're both on tour at the same time. And this is how much Atta cares about her family and cares about her son, that she's willing to give up on her dreams so that Rocky can go live out his in the WWF. And Dewey has a stable home life and doesn't have to be without at least one of his parents while they're on the road. Right. She was like, I'm only going to see him, you know, half of the time. And Rocky's like, well, no. 40%. (laughs) He sees the opportunity and thinks we just have to jump on these because, you know, it's a great opportunity for both of them. But Atta is more willing to put her dream aside. And I think that imagine being faced with the opportunity that you've always wanted or that you never even knew was possible. And then you don't even go and pursue it because you make a decision based on someone else the internal kind of debate that must be going on. But for her, it doesn't even... All she has to do is really just talk the ear off of a cashier <laughs> at a <laughs> at an airport gift shop. Felt so bad for that girl. <laughs> her decision to stay behind and be with her son, I think it's encapsulated in the quote that The Rock says at the end of the episode, which is, ultimately, my mom decided the fight to become a star could wait. It wasn't worth losing these moments with her family. And These moments, these family moments are really what this show is all about. So I think that this show is also a very nice kind of thank you for being my mom type of gesture from The Rock, which is it's basically like a really big Mother's Day card. (laughs) Well, I feel like the whole show is just like a love letter to his parents, especially, you know, his father's not here anymore. It's his way of paying tribute to him and to his mother. Although we didn't see Atta go on the Star Search audition, which would have been really fun. I do love the fact that Rocky's immediate suggestion for a cover (laughs) for Atta (laughs) to perform is my Sharona. And he says it very emphatically. I'm trying to imagine him like jamming to that. (laughs) That was a really big song. (laughs) But all I can think of is My Bologna by Weird Al. Of course. Of course, that's what you go to. (laughs) Now, here's what I would have liked to see. Since Rocky was just so supportive of Atta and really encouraging her with this, I would have liked to see her having to tell him that she's not doing it. Because we just see her telling Dewey. And she says that Star Search called the airport and came over the the speakers, and said they made a mistake. (laughs) I would have liked to see how it went down between her and Rocky because she had been hyping this up. He had been hyping this up. And money is going to be an issue. And this could have changed everything. Well, at this point, it probably seems to her like Rocky succeeding in the WWF with this run with the tag team titles is probably more of a sure thing than just this audition that she has. And that's not to say that she couldn't still go on the audition and just see and get that answer for herself. Right. I would have almost liked to have seen that. Yes. She gets the audition. They want her on the show. But then she says, you know what? No, thank you. This is my this is my victory. And now I will go back and be with my family. But she didn't even need that. Yeah, I wish we had seen her at least go on the audition, go to Los Angeles and then have all of these mental struggles about what she's going to do. I think that would have been a little more powerful, even if it wasn't historically accurate. We don't even know if she ever was intending to audition for Star Surge in real life, do we? No, I haven't seen anything come out about that. We do know that she sings and plays ukulele, as we have seen on late night television. Mm -hmm. But no, and if there's nothing mentioned in The Rock's book as you've been reading it, then I would assume that this isn't in there just for no reason, something like Star Search. Star Search is a real thing. I would assume that this is based in maybe she did at least audition or, you know, send in a tape. I'd like to learn more about that. So that would be interesting to see if The Rock ever mentions that at any point. But Let's move on now to The Rock's story or Little Dewey's story for this episode, which is he's just, he's a kid and he just really wants a boogie board. 
And at this point, he's already driven a car on Rocky's lap, as we found out. So why not give the kid a boogie board? But Atta is really putting up a resistance for this boogie board here. You would you would think that it was like a full on surfboard the way she's telling him no. Yeah. So he sees someone on the beach with a boogie board. And so he suddenly becomes obsessed with them. And he's hiding boogie board magazines under the pillow. Which is a very A Christmas Story move, (laughs) by the way. And I appreciate that. And it had to have been on purpose because that is such an A Christmas Story thing. So, you know, as we said, Ada thinks he's too young. He's only 10. Dewey claims that he's seen kids half his age with a boogie board. So we're talking five-year-olds out in the ocean. (laughs) Wow. But eventually she relents after she, you know, gets her uh, star search audition. And Dewey now has Tanya, (laughs) his beloved boogie board. Unfortunately, though, a bully named Kenny decides he wants it for himself. (laughs) Yeah, and Kenny's a pretty lame bully. I don't know what you think. He needs a group of like 17 dudes and a knife to be intimidating. Kenny rolls deep. (laughs) Kenny rolls deep. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. He, he, I don't know about you, but he reminded me of like a really young Russell Brand or Blanket Jackson (laughs) or BG as he is now known. That's immediately the two things that I thought of when I saw him. And I also thought that he looked like he should have been in Rocket Power as well. (laughs) I think just this whole Hawaiian scene in 1982. Yeah. That's just, you're just automatically going to go to. That'd be great. Otto's getting uh, bullied on the beach. Raymundo shows up with a knife. (laughs) Where was that episode of Rocket Power? (laughs) Yes, there's a lot of knife play in this episode. It was almost like a tropical version of the Beat It video. Oh, boy. And (laughs) something about Rocky Johnson showing up with a knife to threaten little kids is uh, amazing. Which leads perfectly into our favorite trope of this show, supportive husband, father, son-in-law, Rocky Johnson. (laughs) Yes. Now, I don't know too much about real-life Rocky Johnson, but... If he has anything like the Rocky Johnson that is portrayed on this show, then I love him because I love this character. (laughs) Joseph Lee Anderson as Rocky Johnson is one of my favorite characters in all of television right now. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to see Rocky Johnson, real Rocky Johnson, hear his name without thinking of Joseph Lee Anderson (laughs) immediately. I think that that's just who Rocky Johnson is now. Yes. And so supportive is he of his family, that he is willing to do things like show up with a knife and <laughs> and threaten little kids to help his son get his boogie board back, which is both hilarious and very heartwarming. Yeah. And of course, we got that great quote that I mentioned in The Rock Says that he says to Dewey. I also want to point out that something like this actually happened in The Rock's oh, life. Oh, really? Yeah, in, in his book. I don't know if it happened when he was 10 or maybe a little older, but At some point, he got into a fight with a kid named Bobby. They had, like, a whole scheduled brawl and everything, like, for everyone to come see. He ended up being jumped by a group of these this kid's friends. And one of them, named James, had a knife. So he tells Rocky about this. And Rocky shows up with him with a knife of his (laughs) own and says, you want to take your knife out and use it against me like you tried to use it against my son? (laughs) Like, he was ready to kill. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, just it reminds me of the scene in The Jacksons and American Dream where the members of Boys to Men are <laughs> bullying Jackie on the street and Joe shows up and he's like, yeah, y'all want to fight? We're going to do this right. <laughs> and the next, all of a sudden we smash cut to Jackie Jackson boxing a member of Boys to Men. <laughs> but in terms of Rocky... This episode, he was really, he was involved in all three kind of stories. Mm -hmm. He was involved with Ada's, he was involved with Dewey's, he was involved with Leah's. But there are some pretty important historical references for Rocky. As we mentioned, Vince McMahon wanting to pair him up with Tony Atlas and give them a run with the tag team championships in the WWF, which we know did happen in real life. They were the first black WWF tag team champions, which is a very significant historical feat. But Along with a Tony Atlas mention, there is also a reference to the Tony Atlas <laughs> foot fetish, which we also know is a real life thing. So <laughs> I'm really surprised that they mentioned. Now, I don't know a whole lot about Tony Atlas and his whatever he's into. I try. I, I luckily have avoided most of that, <laughs> but I'm really surprised that they they would reference that. 
<laughs> yes, this show pulls no punches when it comes to <laughs> little nuggets they can get in there like that. But uh, yeah, Tony Atlas, quite the character, quite the character in wrestling history. One of the things that Rocky promised us this episode, which I was very disappointed that he did not deliver on, is spaghetti and go-karts. That was his plan for for babysitting Dewey while Ada was gone. <laughs> we were also promised swimming with the dolphins previously, and we haven't gotten that either. Add it to so. the list of things we need to see <laughs> Rocky doing. We need to see him swimming with those dolphins, which how does he do that and not get his hair wet? Because he That's mentioned a- that in this episode, too. He doesn't like to get his hair wet. Maybe he just has given up on on that. He doesn't care. Five, Char- five character- ten years later. Character growth. Yeah, he's he's saying, you know what? The dolphins are worth it. But yeah, spaghetti and go-karts, how does that, what's the logistics of that? Do you eat the spaghetti first and then go go go-karting? Because it seems like you might get a little bit sick, maybe throw it up. So I hope the go-karts are first and then you you cap the night off with a plate of spaghetti, which sounds amazing. Yeah, let's uh, let's do some spaghetti this weekend, I think. (laughs) We've been talking about all of our pasta plans lately on on these episodes. They talk too much about pasta in the show. Yeah, they do. Very food-centric. Really makes you want pasta on a Tuesday night. (laughs) Now, we love some father-son bonding time, and Rocky said that the Johnson boys were going to hit the town. They didn't, though. No. (laughs) Dewey just goes to the beach, (laughs) and Rocky's just wherever he is. Well, yeah, he said the Johnson boys will hit the town and then Ada looked at him and he's like, or oh, just spaghetti and go-karts. So I think that she put the kibosh on that real quick. We also learned that he's never watched Dewey before, which I found outrageous. How has he never been left alone with his well, son before? I mean, he's been a big wrestling star on the road. So when would Ada have to be away That's from true. them? You I just know? figured they'd have a day to themselves at some point. Maybe. <laughs> When, when he's well, got him on his lap driving the car. <laughs> Ada's day to herself was a day in the Hawaiian airport gift shop <laughs> talking to strangers about her personal issues. So, <laughs> But along with Rocky being so supportive, he's the supportive father, he's the supportive husband, he's also a supportive son-in-law. And in being that supportive son-in-law, I think he is way too forgiving yes. to someone who screwed him out of the title a few episodes ago. So let's talk about Leah this episode and her whole saga with Greg Yao. Yeah, so with all that's going on with Yao right now, she doesn't want to be seen as weak by wrestlers, other promoters, and just everyone else. So she has to show that she rules with an iron fist. So this means it's time for her to plot revenge against Yao. So she's destroying his property. She's calling him out personally. But this only leads to more trouble for her because Yao is working with the FBI. All of the collateral damage in this episode in the way of wasted watermelons yes. and destroyed statues. I just, I hate destruction of any kind. I hate physical destruction. I And wasted food is another thing. I'm just like, oh, come on. All those wasted watermelons. But, you know, Bob continues to be a delight, although he is no Gallagher when it comes to <laughs> smashing watermelons. I'll say that. Now, Leah has to go over and just do it herself. I love Bob. Bob's great. Bob is amazing. He, he also at- he also looks like he could be a character in Rocket Power. <laughs> <laughs> he gets he gets mad at Yao because Yao comes into the diner with his cowboy hat on. We're inside. It's daytime. Take your hat off. Yes, Bob is firmly in control of Greg Yao's hat, his headwear <laughs> indoors, and Leah, the queen of Hawaiian wrestling, is in control, or at least she thinks that she can be in control of Yao and his promotion, and also decide how she gets to explain her husband's death, which, yeah. which I thought was a weird, <laughs> he dies how I say he died, like, <laughs> very overdramatic, very overdramatic. That's, that's who she is. And it's funny because, you know, Rocky thought that he had this Yao situation under control. He stole those cowboy boots. What else? He's hurting now. What else can we do to him? Yeah, Rocky Johnson's idea of revenge is very, very small scale, as opposed to Leah, who... Her grand designs of having Yao have to go through her and pay her a tribute fee if he books her wrestlers and all kinds of uh, basically extortion, which is a real life thing that happened, as we've mentioned in the past. And Yao is a stand in for a real life promoter and former wrestler for Peter Mayavia. And this situation did happen and we are seeing it play out in now granted this is a very broad strokes way and I'm sure it was a little bit more intricate than this, but we are seeing Yao working with the FBI and Leah is going to get busted. 
And Yao thinks that that what he has done in this episode is enough to get her, but they say that they can take her down even harder if he gets even more. So Yao has to continue to be involved with the FBI in their efforts to take down Leah. And my main takeaway from this, my main concern is that I hope Bob doesn't get in any trouble when Leah gets busted. In real life, it was her, her booker, and another person who faced extortion charges. So I'm wondering if if Bob is a stand-in for one of those people. I do not want to see Bob get in trouble. I they mean, can they can change anything in this show. They've done it. <laughs> they they have been fast and loose with their historical facts and and real life events. I want Bob to get away. Let him let him get away. Let him make an escape. He didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> He's just being a really good assistant. Leah is evil. <laughs> She's a little evil. Bob's just doing what she says. What's he supposed to do? Uh, you know what's coming, but Leah's in trouble and everyone's going to go down with her, including Bob, I think. And, you know, we had that conversation at the end of the episode between Rocky and Leah, where Rocky brings her the cowboy boots and the FBI, they're just snapping photos. What does this mean for Rocky? You know, in, in real life, I think we know that Rocky is not tied up in this, or at least I don't think he was tied up in this. No mention of him. But what does this mean for Rocky in the show? He's associated with her. What does this mean for Ada as well? What does this mean for anyone? What does this mean for Francie and the dog? What happens oh, to her? That poor dog's just going to die. <laughs> I don't think Rocky and Otto are going to take the dog in. <laughs> Poor Francine. At least we we saw her getting some air in this episode, going out for a little potty break. But yeah, poor Francine. Leah's in trouble, and it's it's really no fault but her own because she's just on this war path, and not a great idea. No, she really needs to just like calm down a little bit. You had Vince McMahon on your side. You don't have to <laughs> be. You don't have to be threatening all of these other promotions. <laughs> just just relax. It's fine. <laughs> you just had a big show. Yes, yes. But as we know, history unfolds the way that it does. So we will surely see some sort of conclusion to all of this in episode 11 when we will again revisit all three time periods. At least to my knowledge, that's what we are doing, kind of the inverse of the pilot, where we will wrap up everything in three time periods. Next week, we will be back in 1991, so I can't wait for that. But overall, final thoughts of this episode. I liked it. I mm -hmm. thought that it was very strong, very strong family moments, but also we got some more drama, and Leah really likes to bring the drama <laughs> to these episodes. So while I usually associate 1982 and these episodes with kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling, and I'm always happy to be back here, there always is that element of drama that comes with Leah and Greg Yao. So it makes it interesting but it's it wasn't the type of drama that I was like, oh, we're really doing this when we when we got the screw job. I, I think that this is very interesting and I'm interested to see what happens, what how this all unfolds in episode 11, the season finale. Well, it's nice because we've been sitting around the past few episodes wondering what exactly happens with Leah because we knew something happened. She gets deported. She finally gets to come back after years. So we're just sitting around waiting. What is it? What is it? What is it? So we finally get that payoff, kind of. So I'm happy about that. I think this was a pretty strong episode. There was some good humor. I love Rocky. Always. <laughs> Always love Rocky Johnson and, and love Ada as well. Yeah. And Adrian Grew continues to be adorable and, and very sympathetic as young Dewey Johnson. But... I can't believe that next week will be the penultimate episode. I can't believe we are already at this stage of the game with Young Rock, and we've almost gotten the complete picture of this season so far. And I'll withhold any real high-level thoughts on what I think of this season as a whole, but I think that it's really just a tale of three different shows happening at the same time. Sometimes it does feel a little bit anticlimactic, already having future knowledge of things that happen, especially in this time period, but... We already kind of know what happens in The Rock's life anyway, True. in a broad stroke sense. So it's not so much about what happens, it's about how they tell the story. And I think this episode, I think they told the story in a nice way and in a nice heartwarming way. And especially Otto making that sacrifice that she did. It's, it's, it's really a nice reflection on The Rock's mom. Ada Johnson. And this, as we mentioned, this series really just kind of a love letter to her, which that's The Rock's privilege to do. You know, if he makes an entertaining show and he can, you know, pay tribute to his parents along the way, then 
more power to him. And that's what I find interesting about this 1982 stuff, because he, if he wanted to, he could really paint Leah in a much better light. That's his grandma. And we would just all go along with it. But he's choosing to show this darker side of her. For and, sure. And that's really, that's interesting to me. Yeah, he doesn't shy away from her reputation. But he also, I think, admires a lot of those qualities which it, it definitely comes out whenever he talks about his his grandma in the narration on the show. He, you know, he admires that about her. I think that in his mind, that's the only way that she could be. You know, she made some mistakes, but it's wrestling's a tough business. And to be the first female promoter on this stage, you know, at this scale, especially taking over a territory like the Hawaiian wrestling scene, I think that she had to be a little bit ruthless. Yeah, that's true. I mean, she doesn't want her husband's business to die. This is his legacy, and she's just trying to carry it on out of respect for him. And it's just, it's got to be rough. And if that means smashing some watermelons along the way, then that's just what you got to do. I wanted to see her personally smashing the watermelons and throwing them on the car and taking down the statues, <laughs> chopping their heads off. Speaking of smashed watermelons, during the diner scene slash Bob attempting to smash the watermelon. We got the song She's a Bad Mamma Jamma by Carl Carlton, a, a funk classic. So that was my favorite needle drop of the episode. And we also got another ukulele performance between Dewey and Ada of Don't Go Breaking My Heart by Elton John and Kiki D, which makes more sense now as to why they did that in that 87 episode entitled Don't Go Breaking My Heart. <laughs> we now know that that was Dewey's favorite song, at least at this point. Yeah. And this kind of goes along with, we've said this before, I wonder how this show was would look after it's all done and you were watching it literally in order of everything, all the 1982 stuff, 1987 stuff, 1990s stuff, yeah. because then I think things would make a little more sense. Yeah, they're, they're doing a little Quentin Tarantino here <laughs> with little some little uh, nuggets like this. Don't go breaking my heart. But I really like this episode. I can't believe we are we are so close to the end here. And I guess my last thought is that I just really miss Randall. I miss Randall. Need more Randall. Always. But that'll do it for this episode of Pro Wrestling Repackaged. Thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate you listening. And reach out to us if you like the show, if you don't like the show, if you hate us, you want us to go away, or if you want more. And let us know what you would like us to look at in the future. We do have an idea of what we will be covering in season two. It just depends on the release dates of things. And I don't want to tease too much, but if you look at our Twitter timeline and some things that we've been retweeting, you might be able to figure it out. So a little bit of a mystery. All will be revealed very soon. But join us next time as we discuss season one, episode 10 of Young Rock. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PWRepackaged and email us at PWRepackaged at gmail.com. Subscribe on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. And visit PWRepackaged.crd.co for links to everything. If you'd like to support the show, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or any other platform that features reviews. Pro Wrestling Repackaged is a Multitrack Minds production. Visit multitrackminds.com for projects and audio production services by yours truly. <laughs>